Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Thomas Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Now, on this show, we really try to uncover the stories and actual insights learned along the way. You know, there's so many paths to producing something great, and we just try to highlight that. And we've had some great conversations. Last week, we talked to Zach Arman and went deep into Armenian wines and how he he and his team are building out a nationwide um, sales network for this little known region. If you're trying to build a brand in a new beverage category or trying to promote a new region, you got to check out that episode for some great tips and advice. Today's episode is sponsored by Barrels Ahead. Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a -a one-of-a-kind marketing strategy, one that highlights your authenticity, tells your story, and connects you with your ideal customers. In short, we help wineries and craft beverage producers unlock their story to unleash their revenue. Go to BarrelsAhead.com today to learn more. Now today, Bianca Harmon is joining us again. She's one of our direct-to-consumer marketing consultants. How's it going, Bianca? It's going good, Drew. I am excited to talk with Amy today and learn all about the wine and food that she has going on. Yes, yes. We have Amy LaBelle on the show today. Amy's the founder and winemaker at LaBelle Winery, and she was recently awarded Business Leader of the Year in New Hampshire. She's a former corporate attorney, and her lifelong interest in wine led her to open LaBelle Winery to pursue her passion for winemaking. LaBelle Winery is, over the years, has really become a destination winery, and Amy has slowly seen her dream realized to focus full-time on making world-class wine in New Hampshire. Welcome to the show, Amy. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for the opportunity. Yes, thank you so much for being on. So, Amy, I got to um, just jump in with something. Your first, because one of my biggest, I've got a secret passion for blueberry wine, oh. <laughs> especially dry blueberry wine. And I read and looking at the show that the very first wine you made was a dry blueberry wine. That is correct. Um, you know, you've got to work with what you have when you're starting out. And I didn't have any wine grapes. So I said, I'll focus on these fruits for a little while. And I started with one gallon of blueberry wine in my Boston apartment. And how, how was it? You're still making it today? I'm still making it today. I think the wine I make today is a little better than that first batch. <laughs> but yeah. you know, the first one wasn't too bad. And it was good enough anyway, to make me believe I had a path forward. So so it's, it's fun pretty, pretty well. Yes. Uh, and I definitely want to go back to the whole history and story, but I had to, I had to get blueberry, this blueberry talk going. So it, you mentioned that it's like a Merlot on your site. The, the yeah, ones so, that we have here. Go ahead. Oh yeah. No, the ones that I've had, the ones that I've been fond of, and there's a wine maker, winery here, Hungry Hawk, and they did a dry blueberry wine, but it tasted, it drank really like a Pinot Noir. And I ended up um, aging it for about four years. I, I was actually just slow to drink it. And they, he's told me he'd never make another one because it was too difficult. So I always like to oh. talk to winemakers about blueberry wine. I actually love making blueberry wine and it does age beautifully because it has a lot of tannin. So the structure mm-hmm. is very similar to a lighter bodied red wine. And I love making it. I work with a, a local farm who grows blueberries. She gives me her best and brightest produce because, you know, you can only make good wine mm-hmm. from a good base product, right? So she gives me her best and brightest produce. Um, they come to me fresh off the, you know, the, the blueberry bushes up in Alton Bay, New Hampshire. And um, they're spectacular. I make three kinds of blueberry wine now. So I make the dry blueberry, which mm-hmm. is ageable. It's delicious with um, like Italian food, you know, so it almost can drink like a Chianti sometimes. It depends on the year. The blueberries do change year to year, just like grapes. But, mm-hmm. you know, Blueberry wine is a great example of how if you treat a fruit wine with respect and you give it all of the love that you would give a grape wine as a winemaker and give it the good yeast and all of the attention and all the maceration time and all the good stuff you need to do, um, you can put out a product that is top quality and that drinks like a grape wine. And it's a great example of how it's not a lesser product because it's a fruit wine, you know? Yeah, I'm so happy. There's a farm there. I have some friends and they have Sari's Ranch or Sari's Ranch and they are a blueberry farm out here. 
in Sonoma County and they make a blueberry wine, but they do it in cans. Oh, fun. So they're doing just like, you know, like poolside ones. And they're first time I was like, is it going to be sweet though? And they're like, no. And, and their family owns like a winery too, but this is just for their blueberries and it's canned blueberry wine. And they're so delicious. I mean, are they sparkling? dry. What? Are they sparkling? Bubbly? Yeah. Bubbly. Nice. And, um, but they're perfect, you know, to, especially like during the summertime, you know, by the and, pool. And, and uh, fruit wines like blueberry make awesome sangria. Oh, oh I'm sure. All right. Awesome. So this actually is a good segue because so you're in our apartment. Your first wine you ever made was the gallon of blueberry wine. So you were practicing attorney back then. Yes, I was. I, I was um, I was practicing at a large law firm and I had just gone in-house to Fidelity Investments. I had like every lawyer's dream job, you know, kind of uh, the corporate job, you know, a little bit better schedule maybe than a large law firm was. Um, and, you know, I was really excited about that. I took after about a month on that job, I had a planned summer vacation. Um, so I took a week off and went up to Nova Scotia, Canada, um, mm -hmm. as planned. And I took my little car with me on the ferry boat, which you can do from Portland, Maine. So you, you know, go to Portland, bring your car on the boat and it brings you and your car to Nova Scotia, which is great. Better than driving the 12 hours it would take to get up and around the horn of Canada. So, mm -hmm. uh, I was driving up the East coast of Nova Scotia, Canada, not in wine country where you all are. Mm -hmm. And I happened upon a sign at the side of the road that was painted with a little white arrow. I can still see it in my mind's eye, hand painted mm -hmm. sign. And it said winery, you know, this way. And I said, well, I have time. I'm on vacation. I'm going to go that way. And mm -hmm. I went down the road, found this little tiny winery that was maybe a thousand square feet. It was teeny tiny place. They were making blueberry wine that day. Mm. And so that was the original inspiration. Right. And, uh, Everybody in there was happy. They were working hard on this beautiful product they were creating. They couldn't wait for me to taste it. They were enthusiastic, excited, the smells, the sights, the sounds, all of that together kind of um, ended up being an epiphany moment for me. It was, you know, my light bulb mm -hmm. moment, the lightning appeared out of the sky, the angels came down and I said, oh my gosh, this is what I'm supposed to do. And so I started obsessing about it at that point. Um, I spent the rest of the vacation figuring out, of course, I was a business lawyer. So mm -hmm. my natural instinct was to begin to write a business plan. So how could I possibly open a winery? How much could it cost to make that product? How much can a bottle of wine cost to make? And I started mm -hmm. through all the business stuff. Forget that. <laughs> well, you know, all of the, all of the, you know, all that stuff that would go into a business plan, right? And who the heck would fund this and all those things. But, you know, forget the fact that I had no idea how to make wine at that point. You know, little details, details. <laughs> so um, I spent the rest of the vacation thinking about that. I got home to my um, Boston apartment after that vacation was over. And I, I unpacked my stuff and I walked over to Borders Bookstore, which was still in business at that time. I bought the two books they had on winemaking. And I brought them home. I read them voraciously and I um, immediately obtained the best blueberries I could find at Whole Foods Market in the frozen section. And I made my one gallon of blueberry wine. By the end of that month, I was a winemaker, technically. <laughs> oh, what a great story. How, I mean, it, it, you, how, would, how did the wine turn out? So that first gallon batch was good enough that I continued forward. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah. So there's that, but you know, it obviously um, wasn't my best blueberry wine, but it was good enough to, to keep the dream alive. And, you know, and you don't know right away, right? Wine is like this, you know, it developed mm -hmm. for months. So I really never even drank that wine until I'd made five or six other types of wines in my little apartment, which is so funny because my apartment was 608 square feet in Boston, right? I lived on the top floor of a Boston brownstone and it was 608 square feet. So that doesn't you know, six, seven gallons of wine fermenting in that space mm -hmm. is quite a lot oh, of geez. awesome aroma, right? Yeah. So what else were you making in your apartment besides all, blueberries? All fruit, all fruit wines, because that's all I could really get my hands on in Boston, right? Um, I, I had, didn't have access to wine grapes at that time. Okay. So I made peach, I made cranberry, I made apple, 
Um, any fruits apple. that I can ferment. Yeah, apple wine is beautiful. Really? Wow. Yeah, apple wine is so, so elegant and beautiful. Pear. Um, so I was kind of playing around with just the, I was learning the science of fermentation. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you can ferment anything. Oh, so, yeah. you know, whatever your the- imagination wants to do. Absolutely. The good enough is the b- best part. I, Cause if you, if you made it and it turned out just awesome, you're like, well, this is easy. There's no more challenge there. You, you, you need it to be just good enough to excite the passion. Like I can make it so much better. <laughs> or if it was so bad, it was such a flop. That's also like, oh, this isn't for me. Yeah. You so know, I think yeah. you hit that first. Perfect. It's such an important point that you're making because um, it, so I, when I had this dream, this epiphany moment, I had just gotten the the really good job, right? And Uh in the legal department of one of the top companies in the world, arguably, right? And I still had $103,000 in student loan debt from law school. Mm -hmm. So if the wine had been really, really bad, it might have Uh weaned me into this, like the naysayer part, you know, the part that said Mm -hmm. that of my brain that was saying, this is silly. Stay the course. You have a great Mm -hmm. job. Cut it out. You got big debt to pay. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yes. That's a lot of student loans, you know, law school wasn't cheap. So, um, you know, luckily it was good enough that I I was able to kind of squash down the part, the practical side and say, I got to go for this. I got to try, I got to try something. So, yeah. So flash forward, you've now created something pretty special that goes far, far beyond wines into food and events. I mean, it's, it's incredible that, um, the layout of what you're operating at now. How did you um, get the winery started? That's always the question people are looking for. How, how do they? How do you go from making wine in your bedroom? Well, not your bedroom, but your your apartment. To, um, it, was, it was 600 winery. feet. I mean, <laughs> right there. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, the winery. I, I say this often when I speak. It's it to crowds. The winery does not. It's such a crazy business and such a difficult thing to enter into, to break into. Um, it's not something you can expect overnight. Mm-hmm. And it's not, so it's, it's something that you really have to be willing to work at in small little bits every single mm-hmm. day to kind of achieve that dream, right? So I had a couple of things working against me. One, I had all the student loan debt. Two, I don't have a trust fund. I am not a trust fund baby, darn it. <laughs> Well, with a hundred and something thousand dollars in student loan debt, I would presume you weren't a trust fund baby. <laughs> well, I kept hoping that one would maybe mature someday, and you know, or they would call me from the trust firm and say, "Hey, your your trust has matured. You now get to trust go." I don't know, but no, that didn't happen. And so um, I had those things. I still, so I did keep. I kept my job at Fidelity for twelve more years while I paid oh, off wow. the debt while I got my degree at UC Davis in California so that I could Ooh. have some science and street cred behind my winemaking skills, right? Because, you know, uh, winemaking, anybody can make wine, right? It's, it's, it's got a lot of art and cooking components to it, you know, in terms of flavor profiles and stuff like that. But you really need the chemistry. Like yeah. they don't teach that in law school. So I really needed to get that street cred. So I did the UC Davis online programs and I only, tra- I traveled there when I needed to, to do labs mm. and in-person lab stuff. So that was, that program is incredible. Uh, so that was, that's something I would highly recommend because it gave me the flexibility to keep my day job, but sure. still, um, you know, be taking my classes at night. So um, that worked out great. So I had to learn how to make wine. I had to pay, pay off my debt. I had to save enough money to, to, you know, get a startup moving. And I had to be practicing. So I was always making wine and always trying to move that ball forward. So um, I started small. And what I like to tell people is that it took me from that day in Nova Scotia, standing in that winery where I felt that epiphany moment to the day I opened the doors at my flagship property was 4,083 days. And I counted those days because I forced myself to do one thing every single day to move the dream forward. It's nothing but hard work and grit and moving it forward little by little. And not giving up. They always talk about the 10,000 hours that you need to master your craft. 
four thousand days. I mean, you, you were probably at about sixteen thousand hours by then, for sure. But probably, probably it does take that time. Now, how did you go about? So, New Hampshire. How did you settle in New Hampshire? So, I was living in downtown Boston, as I said earlier, when when I had this epiphany moment, um, mm-hmm. and I had been, lived in New Hampshire for one year when I was a first year lawyer, and I always enjoyed mm-hmm. the state of New Hampshire very much. I grew up in Massachusetts, but mm-hmm. I love the state of New Hampshire. I love the scenery. I love its proximity to the beach, to the mountains. I mean, where I live, I'm one hour from Boston, 45 minutes from the ocean, 45 minutes from the mountains. It's like, it's got it all for me, you know, and uh-huh. I just love this state so much. I have a big heart for New Hampshire. So, um, When I was living downtown Boston and I knew that this dream of mine was moving forward, I really wanted to move to a a more country setting where I could have a garden, expand my practice and try to, you know, make more and more wine. I needed more room than 608 square Mm -hmm. feet to kind of begin to practice. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, well, maybe I can build a barn and I can, you know, start something small before I can get to the, to the big flagship space. So that's why New Hampshire. So I moved an hour North, but I was able to keep my job in doing so because I worked at Fidelity in Boston, but Fidelity had a campus in Merrimack, New Hampshire with 6,000 people. So I was able to transfer my job up to Merrimack and go into Boston only as needed. So it just all like came together and worked for me to buy a house here. I was a single woman at the time. I bought a house in New Hampshire in a neighborhood and all the neighbors were like, why is this single lady here? What is happening? (laughs) It was very funny. Oh, that's funny. And, and no, so talk to us a little bit about the um, growing conditions and the, what it's like producing wine and growing wine, growing grapes in New Hampshire. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll, I couldn't wait to have my own vineyards because I think every winemaker, you know, probably would love to control her own grapes at some point mm-hmm. or another. Um, it, because there's nothing like seeing the process from bud break, you know, all the way through the summer into Verizon, mm-hmm. making all of those decisions about how we're caring for the vineyard that impact the ultimate product. And then um, to decide that harvest moment, uh, you know, we are, we're picking today, let's go. Um, mm-hmm. And then to, to get to make wine from that immediately. There's such a satisfaction in that full grape to bottle process. Mm-hmm. Um, I couldn't wait to get that done. But New Hampshire, of course, has its challenges. Um, mm-hmm. We are not exactly wine country in terms of climate, although we're not far off. It's not the summer growing season that's tricky here. It's really our winters. Winter. Winter. <laughs> it's winter. Um, and so in my vineyard, you know, we track temperatures daily um, in, in the highest and lowest points in the vineyard, which are always about two degrees off from each other because there's a good elevation difference between them. But um, I've had at least three years where we've hit something like negative 25. <laughs> Ooh. And it, yeah, it's challenging. Um, so we what do, do you do for your vines and stuff during that time. I mean, when it's negative 25, I mean, how does that affect them once the weather starts warming up? I, I mean, they're okay. They, my vines have fared really well because I've planted the correct things in the correct spots. That's what I was going to ask. So are you planting specific varietals? Yes. So I cannot plant noble varieties. I can't grow Cabernet Sauvignon here. Mm-hmm. I can't grow Chardonnay here. Well, I can't grow um, Pinot, can't you? No. So Pinot is only good to, I think, 15 above zero. I think that's the coldest it can get. So um, we grow French hybrid grapes here um, or or the Minnesota hybrids. Um, I've got Mm -hmm. a couple of those as well. And these grapes are all good to 25, 30 below. Um, The year that we had the very coldest, worst winter, I lost maybe eight, five to eight percent of my save all. That was it. Everything else worked right up. That's not terrible. I mean, not bad, not bad. Heck, we've had fires here in California and they're losing entire acreages. So, you know, and, and New York, the Finger Lakes, um, I'm sorry, it wasn't the Finger Lakes. It was Herringer. I heard you had a late frost this year that you've had here, a couple of in years. California. Yeah, yes. we had a, actually it was actually just a couple of weeks ago. We had yeah. thunder, lightning and balls of hail like this big. And it was like. And it was the like last, the first week of May. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. like, whoa. Oh, not what the grapes need right now. Exactly. 
So and they're also saying Oregon might be losing half, half its crop this year due to frost. Oh no. Yeah, I heard that. I actually talked to an Oregon winery this week and they said mm -hmm. that. Oh no. So no, it's just, you can't, you know, you cannot mess with mother nature. It's, it is what it is. And you got to roll with it. Um, we've been pretty lucky here. We typically have bud break right around May 6th, 7th or 8th. So our season start, you know, our, our growing season starts then uh, obviously pruning happens in March and all those, you know, March, early April, we try to wait until the, the vines are really not frozen, frozen solid. Um, you know, when they, when do they usually cold. thaw out? I mean, so how long does it take for these vines to thaw? It's different every year, honestly. Um, we had a very nice winter this year, comparatively. It was milder. Um, we didn't have tons and tons of snow cover, which can be good and bad. You know, if there's three feet of snow that I'm waiting to melt so I can get out and prune, um, that's tricky. However, sometimes we want that three feet of snow cover because they it's protect like the it. vine from wind. So, it, it, you know, it's a toss up. This year was a pretty good winter. So, you know, our vines were ready to be pruned earlier this year because it wasn't as cold and we didn't have that snow cover. So we started pruning about mid-March and we were done in mid-April, had bud break. Um, we did all our tie downs, bud break. Um, we just had May 8th this year. That was oh. a little later because we had a kind of a, it was warm and then it got a little cold and things got a little weird, but it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and no. then we'll have, we'll have harvest probably toward the end of September for the whites and reds. Oh, okay. On the native roots, so are you working with, some, you mentioned the Minnesota root stocks or Minnesota vines? Are you <laughs> dealing with Mar Marquette and what are, what are the varietals that you're working with? Yeah. Um, so we planted, we've got seven varieties on property. I have um, Seval Blanc, mm -hmm. Petit Pearl. Seval Blanc is a French hybrid. The Petit Pearl is one of those Minnesota hybrids. And I love this grape. It Petit. is Petit Pearl. It's, it's new-ish. It's a new hybrid that's been- Is it like a Syrah? It is, honestly. And it, it's one of the few wine grapes that's red throughout. Um, you know, usually wine yeah. grapes. So like Mouvedre is one of the few grapes that is actually produces red juice and yeah. Gamay actually yep. does as well. Um, so it's a deeply pigmented, deeply flavorful red wine. And, um, you know, I, I think for often one of the things people think is that cold climate red wines aren't as beefy or hearty, or they don't have as much mouthfeel, but Petit Pearl has it in spades. And so you can make a really rich, beautiful, big wine with it. Um, we plant, planted Noiré, which is another French hybrid, um, Noiré, N-O-I-R-E-T, uh, has tons of, that's another bigger uh, French hybrid in terms of flavor profile, has a lot of black pepper and white pepper notes on it, really interesting. Sounds right? like a zen almost. It is very much. Um, so I love to blend that um, in one of my wines called Americus, which is our mm -hmm. tribute to the American dream. Um, Americus is uh, half Noiré and half Cabernet Franc. So the kind of wildness of Noiré is beautiful with the, the elegance of Cab Franc. So you can pat, you so you can plant Cab Franc. No, I have to bring that from New York. Okay. Okay. Yep. So, uh, so where are we at? I have Chancellor. I think I mentioned all my grapes now. There's, I have one more. I had a little experimental patch of Brianna, which, which I didn't like. So I kind of let that go, but, um, down in my second vineyard that we're developing now in, in at my new location, we opened a second location in Derry, New Hampshire. Um, and we've just planted another three acres there. And we just planted a new hybrid called Itasca, which is um, a subset of the Saval Blanc hybrid, which oh. a Saval Blanc is awesome. And I love working with Saval. I have worked with that grape for 20 years now. It's awesome. And um, that is a, that Saval is a clone of Sauvignon Blanc and a number of I know some numbers I don't have memorized, but mm -hmm. they're a clone. So it's very similar to Sauvignon Blanc, but it can withstand our cold climates. I love the, love the yeah. thought process that goes into that. Are you planting fruit trees on the, and I, in, as far as it, producing some of your fruit wines, are those produced in house or would purchase fruit from around the area? No, we rely on local farmers to give us all of the fruit, except for the jalapenos which I use to make my jalapeno culinary wine. Ooh, we grow, we grow those on talk, so Tell me about the jalapeno. About yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a fun. 
Yeah, no, that's a fun little wine. Um, I make three culinary wines in my lineup because I also love to cook. And mm -hmm. so that's really embedded in my, um, in, in the culture of LaBelle Winery. So the three culinary wines are an onion, a tomato, and the very popular jalapeno pepper culinary wine. So you can cook with it. Obviously, um, it's it's 100% fermented jalapenos. Um, you can use it in millions of things, uh, spaghetti sauce, fajitas, tacos, steak marinades. It's great. I am fascinated. I am Crushed too. jalapenos. So it's just purely fermented jalapenos. Yes. And it doesn't, I mean, I'm, I ferment jalapenos and it turns into a hot sauce. Oh, I, that would be yummy. I add water. <laughs> okay, you add some water. Okay. <laughs> I add some water. I macerate them and I, I actually put them in huge nylon bags so they're easier to remove from the, because I don't want to put this through my press, right? That would be a sure. disaster. Oh my so, gosh, that would. <laughs> imagine all the wine would be dedicated spicy. For, yeah, you oh dedicated God, for your wine place. would forever be tainted with jalapeno. Exactly. It would taste so. Like are you are you making it for cooking purposes mostly, or are people drinking this? Both. So I have some customers that love it to sip on. Um, I yeah. have a lot of customers who use it in, in cocktails. So yeah, so do, stick that. like stay with me here. If you make a gorgeous margarita and you put an ounce or two of jalapeno wine in it, it just like has this awesome heat or this warmth to it. Oh, it's great. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm also, gonna have to tell my sister about it because she's really into the um, spicy margs. Oh yeah. Exactly. So that's, it's also I great. feel like that would work. Oh, it totally works. It's awesome. Um, and it's also great in um, this other cocktail we make at the winery called the Gentleman's Martini. If we put in an, a half an ounce or an ounce of the jalapeno wine, we then call it the Caballero. So then it's oh. a little bit spicy, which is fun. Um, and then we also use it all the time on our brunch menu in the uh, Bloody Marys. Oh, that's wow. fantastic. And you also mentioned the tomato wine. Got to talk yeah. to me about that. Talk to yeah. us about that. So the tomato wine is another just fun side project. It's not meant to be a serious wine at all. It's just kind of a mm -hmm. fun culinary wine. Really great in soups. Also makes a very refreshing vodka cocktail. So I like to mix mm -hmm. wine and cocktails all the time. So a couple ounces of tomato wine, a couple ounces of vodka, ice, lime. You're, you know, sweeten it or don't, you know, up to you. Totally fun. And onion wine. Onion wine, you know, onion wine, if you had a bottle of onion wine, which I don't know if anybody else in the world makes onion wine. I don't, I don't know, know, but I'm like I'm very scared. intrigued. I'm it scared. I once got on a, a health kick where I drank a cup of onion juice thinking that I could get a lot more vitamin K and I have oh. not been able to eat red onion since. I wouldn't recommend doing that. <laughs> no, that sounds awful. It was, but I thought that was a great way to vitamin k Horrible <laughs> it's awful so we don't drink onion wine but we do cook with it and if you have a french onion soup in my restaurant made with onion wine you mm. are in heaven oh my gosh french onion soup it's one of my favorite things to make at home most pain in the butt things to make but you know yeah so how much onions wine so say you're making you know a big dish for your family how much onion wine are you using in the French onion soup process? Well, it depends on how much soup you're making, but you know, I always use a lot of wine when I cook always. And so, you know, for that, you know, you're making your stock and you're definitely putting in at least a cup of, of onion wine in it, you know, um, and, and reducing down, or you could caramelize your onions with that first and then, you know, make them have this. Ah, awesome. Yeah. It's wow. It's My mind is blown there. by these. Fun. Yeah. It, it, Wow. So yeah, the, so these projects are kind of part of your larger project, the winemaker's kitchen. And you've got some other wares. Talk to us about this winemaker's kitchen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the winemaker's kitchen is is kind of a, a side project for the winery um, that you know really ties together my love of winemaking and cooking. And mm. so for a decade now, I've been teaching classes in all of our locations. We have three locations around the state now. Um, at least a couple times a month. So, you know, we're talking hundreds of classes at this point on how to integrate wine into your daily cooking to elevate your, your culinary process at home, right? How wine makes your food better or how to use it in a cocktail. So every class starts with a cocktail, um, a wine mm -hmm. cocktail. So we're always showing people how they can lighten up, you know, a heavily alcoholic cocktail by substituting some wine in there, which is 
really fun and tasty and adds a different layer of flavor. You know, it's always about the layers and bringing more and more to that, to that culinary table. But, um, so we start with a cocktail and then we do three recipes that have wine as a main ingredient. And we're teaching people every day how to use their wine better. You know, yes, you're drinking your wine, of course, right out of the bottle, but what if you can't drink the whole bottle? What if it's Tuesday and you maybe shouldn't have the whole bottle because you got to work the next day. Well, then you might have this much wine left in the bottom. And what are you going to do with that? You know, it's not as good the next day or the day after that. We all know that. Um, and I, if we had another hour, I'd tell you the exact chemistry of why and what's happening there. But your wine is not going bad. It's just turning to vinegar. That's the next step for wine, right? So we teach people how to use those little leftover bits, you know, put them in soup, put them in stew, marinate your steak in it, put it in a salad dressing um, or put it in a cocktail. And so people love this concept because it cuts back on waste. And then, you know, you, you don't feel like you have to finish that bottle. You can just have three glasses and that one last glass you're going to make into a stew. It's going to be fine. Well, that's perfect. Yeah. I love that. And that, the, the, what, that this message is about to reach a much broader audience from what I hear. Yes. Why make it? That is. Go ahead. Out of the bag. Let, let me know. So it looks like you're getting picked up with a full TV show. Yes, that is the plan, and that is the hope. So fingers crossed. Um, so a, a, a Hollywood producer uh, noticed the work that we've been doing uh, to, to do winemakers kitchen classes on YouTube. Um, a lot of that work really came out of the pandemic when mm -hmm. we were shut down for for the pandemic. Um, I felt that I still had to teach in my community. Um, the people in my community had a need. They, they needed to learn how to cook at home. They needed uh -huh. projects to do with their families. So we started putting these classes out on YouTube um, on, you know, making pasta. Here's how to make raviolis with your kids. Here's how to do pizza dough at home, tortillas, mm -hmm. all the things you couldn't find in the stores. I don't know how it was in California, but it was a little weird here. We couldn't find stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, we were teaching people how to make, how to cook. And I, people were panicked. My friends who don't cook, who usually just go out every day or order takeout or whatever, they were like, I don't know what to do. Um, so we taught them what to do. And these videos got noticed by a producer in California who has since come out. We filmed a sizzle reel and we've developed an entire lifestyle show based around cooking, wine, integrating those things together and around my busy life um, running three winery properties and a family. I have two um, young boys. So that's we're making so, it work. That's so cool. Because, you know, like, like a big thing in my household is like, you know, there's three, I have three kids and, you know, two of them are much older, 14 and 12 and one of them's 18 months. And it's like, you know, the big thing is, is they're all out doing their thing all the time, all day long. But dinner is the one time that we sit down and we eat dinner as a family. But my daughter has a friend who, and I talk about it all the time and their family, they literally, she sends her daughter out to get food for them all the time, every night for dinner. And I'm like, Aurora, and like, she'll, my daughter will text, Hey, can I go with them to get this? I'm like, no, you can come home and eat dinner. I made you dinner. Sorry. You know? Yeah. And so for me, like my mind is like blown sometimes like, wow, there are really people that go out and they eat dinner every night or they have their kids. And for me, it's like a huge that's our one time that we sit down. And so you're taking all of this and I don't know, I, I think it's so cool. And just, I love it because when her friend comes over here, it's like, she's not used to like eating home cooked meals, you know? It's, it's a really, really important thing that I prioritize in my life. Um, so similar to you, we do family meal every night. Um, we do family breakfast too. Um, it's just really important to have that centering moment with my family. Cause we are so busy um, right. get a little bananas otherwise, but it's so important that I carve out two hours on Sunday to do all my prep for the week. And so I oh. cook, I prep everything. So I know what I'm having every single day. Um, until Friday, Friday's pizza day. And we either make our own dough and make pizzas with whatever's left over, or we order out pizza. That's the one day. Um, but we I have, need to take some prep lessons from you then. Oh my gosh, this is going to be in the show. So you can watch the show. Okay. It's so, it's so easy to get prepped for the week. Like if you cook off a pound of bacon, you boil off a half a dozen eggs or a dozen eggs. So you have hard boiled eggs. You mm -hmm. cook off two pounds of chicken, you, um, you know, make a big salad, make one big soup, 
make your batch of rice, your brown rice, roast off mm -hmm. some veggies. All these things can be done in two hours or less. And then you, your, your week is so much easier. You know, maybe prep one pasta meal, whether it's a baked ziti or a lasagna or something so that it's done and it's ready to go. When you get home, you can just pop it in the oven and you can have your family time. Wow, you know? that sounds fantastic. It's really Instead important. Of me spending an hour and a half each night cooking dinner. It's, it's, mm. it's, it would change your life if you could get in that habit of that Sunday prep. And if you think about it, you're also um, doing dishes on Sunday and you're not making that huge mess during the week either. It, it simplifies yeah, I'm everything. not cleaning up the kitchen every single night. Exactly. It's so much easier. Wow. Wow. So that'll be on the show too. Cool. That'll be on the show too. So, you know, it'll blend a little bit of how I run my business, you know, me as a business person, me as a mom, how do I do that? And then head off to football practice and how am I feeding everybody in the meanwhile? And, you know, the, the integration of wine into all that. And of course it will focus on me as a winemaker. So yes, me making wine. It's good. What a and you are a Jack of all traits, Amy. I, I get a lot out of my days. I'd like to follow you around one day. I think maybe it looks like you will on <laughs> maker kitchen. <laughs> that, I love what came out. Like I always try to find the, the silver linings that came out of the pandemic and had there not been a pandemic, you might not have stepped up the YouTube. You might not have stepped up this outreach and it sadly, I mean, it gave you a platform to create, to really broaden your audience. And we've seen a lot of those success stories on the show. So it's really good to hear that. Absolutely. It's you, you always have to look for the silver lining. Yeah, it's, um, it's far, I, when I, I see the logo on your shirt, so you've got the links. Oh, I'm always yeah. curious to talk about um, wineries, balancing wineries and golf. And where did the, was golf already part of the land when you got it? Or is it something that you built into it? Yeah, so um, my golf course is at the new property that we obtained in 2020 at the end of 2020 in, at the dairy property. It was already existing. And mm. So that, that was another silver lining that came out of the pandemic. Were you a golfer prior? Or, I mean, was golf one of your things that you enjoyed? I love to golf. I just don't have time to golf. Um, I had a lot more time when I was a lawyer. Let's put it that way. Before I was married and had kids. You know, when I was a single lawyer in Boston, I golfed all the time. Okay. Um, I don't have time now because I, if I have two hours or four hours, I would definitely rather give it to my kids. So I figure once I, I golf in tournaments and once in a while now, and I figure when my husband and I retire and the kids are in college um, or whatever, uh, we'll golf more then. But for now, it's kind of like just a little fun recreational thing. But we definitely hit our own golf course once in a while. And my older son is, is picking it up. So if the kids are with us, we'll definitely golf with them. That's that's a fun family activity. And golf is great in that way. It's like a great leveler. You know, grandparents can play with grandkids and men and women can play together. It's, it's so are you serving your wine and cocktails out on the golf course or how Absolutely. is that all incorporated? Okay. okay. Yeah. So let me, well, I'll tell you about the dairy property. It's so interesting that, so this property family, mm -hmm. Who, um, who the father developed it really. And he passed away in, early in 2020 and the um, children did not want to run this property. So they contacted us in the summer of 2020. Now we were just starting to like make our way out of the pandemic closures and trying mm -hmm. to make sure that we were stabilizing our, our, our the business we had. And they called us and said, hey, you know, we really want to sell this. We'd like to sell it to you so that we are positive it will be carried forward in the spirit that our father intended. Um, we know you'll do a really good job because they visited our other property and blah, blah, blah. So we, we said, you're crazy. We can't do this. Um, we are just recovering from the pandemic. And no, we can't do it. But then I was so mad and I, I hate missing a great opportunity. And I, I really wanted to buy this place. So we went down and toured it because I'd been at this property. I knew I was aware of what it had to offer. We went and toured it again and we struck a deal that, that, that I could get comfortable with. This place has a golf course. It has an event center. It had a restaurant that was, had been closed for many years anyway. So we had to resurrect that. Um, and it had a, a, an outbuilding that was the golf pro shop, which we've turned into um, a French uh, Parisian style market. So oh, nice. it, it's really, it's got this gorgeous, 
feel to it. It's got a big pond and a big fountain and it's just a lovely mm -hmm. place. But we took the driving range that was there and we transformed that into a vineyard. So mm. there's no more driving range at the golf course. And the, some of the golfers don't like that, but I need grapes. Well, on a so, nine hole, you don't need a driving range. Exactly. I, I'm really into this. I mean, $8, this mini golf course. I mean, what a fun, beautiful, it's not at like some tacky, you know, family event mm -hmm. thing. You have this beautiful mini golf course for families to come enjoy too. I mean, how incredible. Well, that little mini golf course is stunning. It's got a lot of water. It features. is. It's not like a clown in the mouth, you know, ball in the mouth of the clown. Right. It's place. stunning. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, what we're finding is that because we've also licensed that um, for, for alcohol consumption, we're finding a lot of so date cool. on the mini golf course. So they come, they play around in mini golf, and then they go to the restaurant, which is great. <laughs> Super fun. I mean, what a great family night out, affordable family night out, you know? have yep. cocktails, play golf, then eat dinner and head home. It's awesome. And then, you know, we're selling ice cream for the kids and, you know, it's really a little something for everybody. It's very family Everyone. oriented. Yep. Complete and on that property, experience. it's a complete destination. Um, you can spend the whole day at, at either of my properties really, but um, in dairy, we just last week had the ribbon cutting on our new uh, wine tasting and um, production facility where I needed more wine space. So we built a new, a new building on the new, the new property. And we are going to be producing um, champagne there. Um, Method Champagne oh. was legit, real French style champagne. I'm so excited. What kind of grapes are you going to be using? We're going to do a, a blend of Seval Blanc, the Itasca and some Cayuga, which is an American um, grape that has a lot of floral and is very grapey. It's going to be delicious. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that'll be a white sparkler. And then we're going to do a rosé as well, which I think I'll base in Grenache and Syrah. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Awesome. Um, I wish more winery. I think that that's the trend is you really got to build, you can build the, you can make wine, but the, the, for the vast majority of wineries, you need to have some sort of a destination to appeal for everybody. And I love what you're doing there, integrating the restaurant, the stores, the, oh, it's, fantastic to hear that it, especially in this day and age you know part of like the the problem with like napa for example is we don't i mean not everybody has somebody that can take care of their children so that they can go on vacation you know so and then napa, you can't eat and you can't get a glass of wine right <laughs> right and so it's like you know the one place around here which is great is like visa tui you know because you can eat you can drink you can the kids can come all of that. And that's why it is what it is. That's why it's so popular, right? Cause it's one of the few places you can go do that. Yeah. But you know, a lot of and, these and who can afford a babysitter these days anyway, right? That's what I'm saying. So, and a lot of these parents, myself included, I mean, part of why I'm sitting here, like, why do I live in San Molina anymore? There's nothing for me and my family to do that's affordable, you know, is, and so it's like, you're looking for places like that, where you can go be adults, for a little while, but the kids are having a good time and yeah. you've just nailed it. All of it. I'm just Thank so you. thoroughly impressed. I want to come like visit New Hampshire. Thank, now. You. Thank you. You should, I would absolutely encourage it. It's a beautiful. <laughs> uh, no segue. I just want to congratulate you on your rebrand. I just saw it on LinkedIn that you just launched the new label line and logo. So that's always a huge, huge task to, to rebrand something. Oh my gosh. Sure. Yes. We're looking around the building at all of the signage and the little tiny details that were like, oh no, we have to pick, change that. Oh no, we have to change this. There's so much that goes into a rebrand um, and it's expensive, but it, it, it was necessary. You know, the, the origin of my brand started, you know, 15 years ago, uh, 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, it, the, what the, the label just didn't kind of fit where we had evolved to. Mm -hmm. And so we really needed to bring the label into a more, a more modern uh, feel that, that reflected where we feel the quality of the wine is today and the brand in general. So we're really also, excited. So it still pays, it still pays respect to everything that it was like, it isn't a completely new thing. It just looks like a more elegant, modern, expression of what you are and probably more accurately represents what you're doing. Thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. I think it's beautiful. I'm kind of slowly falling in love with it. And um, it's it's tricky at a winery, as you know, or any any beverage producer really to change a label because now I've got old labels hanging out and I'm, I'm using those mm -hmm. as case labels or whatever, which is fine. Um, but I've got wine in the warehouse that is aging that has the old label on it already. It's going to take a while to cycle this all through. So for a while, we're living with both labels side by side and just trying to work through that. There's a lot of creative things. I mean, I, you probably know this, but a lot of like places around here, like a winery I worked at, they had a ton of old labels of stuff and they would make candles. So there was a guy that would take the wine bottles and cut off the tops and they would make handmade candles and they'd slap the old labels on them. Those things would sell like hotcakes. I mean, like yeah. if you're, there's just little kind of fun. And then people like it because it's like a memory of we've been coming here for so long. Yes, absolutely. And that is, um, you're right. Our loyal customers, they love the nostalgia of the old label. They, and they're, some of them are kind of viscerally impacted. They're like, oh, you know, ah, like you changed the label. The, oh, what, where's the yellow? Where's the, you know, know, everything's okay. The wine inside is still good. The wine's even better. What do you mean? Yeah, everything's <laughs> fine. <laughs> we just got to, they, they've been with us so long, some of these customers, especially our vineyard club, which is an amazing group of about 150, 200 people. They, they all sponsor a vine in the vineyard and they have their name on a vine and they come to harvest. So they get, that's the that's main amazing. benefit. They, we invite them to come harvest and these people harvest all my crop in three hours. It's incredible. Um, that's genius. It's amazing. <laughs> Free so later. It's, it's, it's absolutely is the only thing that we have to do is afterward, we have a huge celebration. Um, you know, after the three hours of picking, we do a huge family table with a gorgeous brunch and all the wine that we picked the year prior is poured at that brunch. It is such a special, special day. So we feed them like crazy and they're happy to give us the labor. It's great. But it's those people, you know, they've been around this a long time and they're our best supporters and they're kind of like, ah, a new label, but they'll people be okay. don't like change. You mm -hmm. know, they don't. I mean, I, I worked at a winery where one of the long, long wines was a port style wine, but they went from a paper old school classic label and they did the screen print and people freaked. Yeah. This doesn't have a paper label on it. And it's like, it's the same stuff. I promise they're just going for a new look. It's the 125th anniversary. Like, mm -hmm. I, I promise everything's okay. Everything's fine. <laughs> everything's fine. That's I say. That's my saying all the time. Everything's fine. We're all fine. I say that a lot too. <laughs> everything's fine. I'm going to get shirts made that say that. Mm -hmm. With like a dumpster fire. Yes. Going everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Amy, this has been a really, really, really satisfying episode for me. I always like to ask, is there anything we haven't covered that you want to bring up? Gosh, you know, I think that, um, thanks for the question, because what I want to tell the world is that give wines from other regions a chance, you know, I, and mm. I, I say that with like all respect and deep sincerity and love for wines from around the world, but, and for California in particular, but there's the, been for a, too long, a perception that good wine is only made in France or California. Mm -hmm. And I, and there is awesome wine made in both of those places. Um, but there's great wine being made all around the country now. And so I, I beg your listeners to give wine in, in all 50 states a chance. Um, try something new. You know, I, I don't go and get that usual bottle of Chardonnay that you pick up at the store every week. Don't buy that anymore. Buy something different. <laughs> buy something you've never heard of. Buy a blueberry wine. And make mm. Drew happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's that is, I, if we could get that message out, our job will be done. I mean, I love to highlight all these regions. So Amy, <laughs> where can people find out more about your wines in LaBelle Winery? Yeah, so you can visit labellewinery.com uh, to see our website and get all of the um, sense of what we're doing here. Uh, you can visit LaBelle Winery on Instagram at LaBelle Winery or on Facebook. Uh, you can also, to get on my personal Instagram page, you can do at Amy LaBelle Winemaker. 
And there you get my personal recipes and stuff that I'm working on at home. So my family recipes, my prep lists and all my prep for my following it right now, Amy, follow it at Amy Lavelle winemaker. (laughs) That's where you'll see updates on the, on the show. Um, You'll see my gardening and what I'm planting in my garden for the summer and all of the fun things that I'm working on at home. And uh, often the thing, the recipes I work on at home become recipes for the winery, but not always. So it's good to have, um, good to have the personal follow as well. That's fantastic. Well, Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. It's been a real pleasure. Have a great day. You as well. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. Thank you.